हेलो एवरीबॉडी दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोसाइंसिस एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई गुवाहाटी एंड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द न्यू टॉपिक एंड दैट टॉपिक इज द इम्यूनोलॉजी सो इम्यूनोलॉजी इज द फील्ड ऑफ साइंस व्हिच बेसिकली स्टडीज द इम्यून सिस्टम सो बिफोर गेटिंग इन द डिटेल्स ऑफ द इम्यूनोलॉजिकल टूल्स वट आर अवेलेबल विद आस एंड हाउ टू एक्सप्लॉयड दैम we have to understand how the immune system works and so that you will be able to understand in which uh, context we are going to be able to utilize these tools and how to uh, exploit them for understanding the different types of biological problems so immune system is the system is which protects the organism against the invading pathogens and these are specific reactions which induced in a host by an antigenic stimulus is known as the immune response so once a foreign antigen such as the bacteria virus or fungus get entered into the host uh, it actually uh, recognizes this uh, particular organism as the non self and in in response to the non self the immune system exert it start exerting the reactions which actually are going to destroy this foreign organisms so collectively all the responses what are being developed against a foreign antigen is known as the immune response and these immune responses could be of two different types it could be a humoral mediated immunity or the cell mediated immunity in the humoral immunity mediated immunity mainly the antibody complement and other humoral components are mediating this particular type of immunity which means all humoral response means all response what is being mediated by the liquid component for example if the cell is secreting some cytolytic enzymes cell are secreting the antibodies cell are secreting the um, complements and all these are actually circulating within the blood and they are actually continuously monitoring the foreign organism so as soon as the foreign organism enter into the body this humoral response are actually recognizing these cells and then either they are killing these cells or they are actually taking the help from the cell mediated immune response that's why the humoral response provides the defense against the bacterial pathogen as well as the viral pathogen so the humoral response is the early response which is being developed against the very deadly pathogens such as the bacterial response or the viral response for example when we when we get the cold or uh, influenza infections we the first response which comes is that uh, is the easy humoral response that is the the virus is been recognized by the antibodies as well as the other uh, components of the humoral response and they try to elicit the immune response similarly if there will be a bacterial infections the complement as well as the related um, system is actually been activated and that's how they destroy the bacterial cells humoral response always take the help from the cell mediated response to create more robust and long lasting response so the other response is the cell mediated immunity where you involve the cells such as the t and b cells it protects the organism against the fungi virus and facultative intracellular bacterial pathogens and it provides it also provides the immunity against the cancers so the cell mediated immune response is more robust it long lasting and it actually creates a memory within the organisms so whenever there will be a second round of inter, uh, the encount second round of entry of the similar pathogens it actually instantly recognizes this pathogen and creates the robust immune response and the cell mediated immune response is against the fungi viruses and especially the intracellular pathogens for example the mycobacterium tuberculosis and in addition to that when the cell is getting irregular or cell is actually getting transformed into the cancer cells the cell mediated immune response is also acting against the cancer cells to eliminate them from the body so the uh, within the humoral response the antibody is 
the central molecule which is taking uh, place or which is actually uh, do governing the different types of immune responses involving the different types of cells. And that is why before getting into the detail of the further immune responses, it is important to understand the structure of a immune antibody so that you will be able to understand the, uh, the interaction of the antibody with the antigen as, as well as the other applications of the antibody. So, antibody is a Y shaped structure or Y shaped molecule which actually contains the two chains, one is the light, uh, one is the heavy chain and the other one is called as the light chain. This, uh, so, you have the two heavy chain and the two light chains uh, which are being uh, bound to each other by the uh, sulfhydryl bridges between the heavy as well as the light chain. And uh, apart from that, so this Y shaped molecule has two region, one is the heavy chain uh, region which is called or the C terminal region which is called as the constant region and the, the top region which is of uh, formed by the li light chain as well as the heavy chain is called as the antigen binding site. So, you can imagine that whenever there will be an antigen which is coming into the vicinity of the antibodies, it is actually interacting with this particular portion and this particular portion is recognizing this antigen and if the interaction is stable enough, it actually goes and binds to the antigen binding site. Apart from that, this uh, antibody is, uh, is very, very susceptible for some of the proteases. So, if you for example, if you uh, treat this particular prote uh, the antibody with a protease, the most some of the proteases are cleaving this antibody into two parts, keeping the constant region uh, away from the, uh, from the variable region or the antigen binding region. So, that is how you can be able to fine tune the, the production of the antigen antibody in such a way that it is actually going to activate the cellular machinery, but it will not be able, it will not bind to the antigen. So, because this region is a constant region, it actually has a receptor for onto the cell surface. So, what happen is when the antigen binds to this particular antibody, this constant region is binding to a receptor and that is how it actually is governing a uh, downstream signaling uh, into the cell and that is how it actually is eliciting the immune responses from those particular cells. And that is how the antibodies which are actually circulating into the blood is binding to the antigen and that is how it is actually uh, bringing the antigen bound antibodies to the receptor and that is how it is actually activating those cells for causing the more robust immune response. Apart from that, because the antigen uh, is binding to the, uh, the this particular antigen binding site, it is not allowing the antigen to move around. For example, if you have a bacteria which is actually uh, could be uh, uh, dangerous for the host bacteria cannot replicate until it is freely moving. So, what happen is the bacteria is going to bind to this particular region of the molecule and as a result the bacteria is going to be sequestered into a very small area. So, the antibodies are mainly doing two main function. One, it is actually sequestering the antigen to a very, very localized area so that the other cells such as the macrophages and dendrite cells and all other kind of uh, T cells and B cells actually come to that particular vicinity and could be able to destroy this particular foreign antigen. Apart from that, this antigen bound antibody is actually going to bind to the receptors present on the immune cells and that is how it is actually going to activate the downstream signaling and that downstream signaling could actually be able to activate the more robust immune response from those cells either it would be in the form of production of more amount of antibodies or it could be in the, in the, in the form of production of the cytolytic enzymes, free radicals and all other kinds of immune responses so that 
the this particular foreign antigen or foreign uh, uh, pathogenic organisms could be destroyed by this. So, this is the main function of the antibodies in the uh, which, which is participating into the immune response. Let us see how the antibodies are being produced in a host such as the humans. So, antibody generation is a four step process in an organism under the natural conditions. It has a lag phase. So, in the lag phase what, what is happening is that it is actually uh, the in, in this particular phase there will be an entry of pathogen and then this pathogen is going to be contacted by the immune cells. So, this is actually a lag phase which is also could be called as the preparative phase where the foreign antigen will enter into the host body and then this uh, foreign antigen is going to be recognized by the immune cells and then they are actually going to start the preparation for how to tackle this foreign antigen. In the second phase you have the log phase. So, in the log phase you are actually going to see there will be an increase in the antibody production which means the, anti, the uh, immune cells ha, uh, have now acquired or understand the strategies how to tackle this particular foreign antigen and then they have gone through multiple processes and in which processes and uh, after the end of this processes they have started producing the antibodies and they, as I said in the previous slide itself that these antibodies will now start sequestering this antigen so that it should not be able to spread throughout the body. Then in the third is the plateau phase. The plateau will be the equilibrium between the antibody synthesis as well as the catabolism. So, at this stage actually the foreign antigen is about to getting the eliminated from the body or because at this stage the antibody production as well as the antibody which has been bound to the antigen or which has been already been consumed is going to be the same. That is why if you see the antibody production is going to be constant through, throughout this region and then you are going to have the decline phase. So, there will be a decline of antibody titer which means the antibody production is going to be down. So, at this stage the infection is going to be sustained to a particular localized area but and but still the, the active in infection is there. So, the antibody production as well as the destruction is going to be remain constant and then you it, it enters into the decline phase where the antibodies are going where the antigen is going to be eliminated from the body which means you with the organism has removed the infection from the uh, body and that is how there will be no need to produce the antibodies and that is how the antibody production is going to be uh, decreased. At this stage only the, the organism is going to start producing the memory cells or it is actually going to train the cells so that it actually going to keep a memory of the this particular foreign antigen. So, whenever this in this happens in the second response or the second time the time what the organism has taken for the lag phase as well as the log phase to do the preparative step is going to be shortened and as a result if the same organism comes into the second stage it the the immune response is going to be the faster and that is what the reason is that when you are vaccinating the uh, children's or even the adults you are actually doing nothing but the reducing the preparative stage so that as soon as the organism comes the body will start producing the antibodies and then these antibodies are actually going to start sequestering the antigen to a localized area and then start acting them so that the immune system is going to be eliminate them. Now, uh, let us see how what are the different events are required for uh, getting the antibodies produced in the in the organisms. So, the first event is that the antigen is going to enter into the host body and then the as soon as the antigen will enter into the host body the first cells which are going to be uh, activated or the first cell which are going to encounter these antigens are called as antigen presenting cells. These cells are either the macrophages or the dendritic cells. So, in every part of the body where the, there, there is a chance that you have the uh, entry of the foreign antigens, you have the 
macrophages as well as the dendritic cells. For example, you have the cuffer cells which are present in the liver, you have the uh, alveolar macrophages which are present in the lungs and then you have the uh, macrophages in every organ, uh, every uh, organs so that if there will be any infection which is going to that particular organ, the first cell which is going to encounter this particular foreign antigen is these macrophages. So, what is the job of these macrophages is that they will actually going to process the antigen. What is mean by process the antigen is that they are actually going to digest this antigen and they are going to generate the antigenic peptides which means the organism is going to be destroyed and then you are actually selecting the antigens which uh, the, you are selecting the peptides which are antigenic and then these antigen presenting cells will present these antigens or the antigenic peptides with the help of the MSC class 2. Once they present these uh, antigenic peptide with the anti, uh, MSC class 2, these are going to activate the T helper cells and the T helper cells in response to the antigen presenting onto the MSC class 2 is actually going to activate the downstream B cells and once the B cells are activated, they are start going to produce the antibody which actually going to again further stimulate these actions. So far the uh, antigen is entering into the body and antigen presenting cells are actually recognizing the antigens without the help of any tool. For example, the, if, if there will be a, a bacteria, the antigen presenting cells are recognizing the bacteria only by the, uh, the, uh, the proteins which are present onto the bacterial cell wall. But as soon as the uh, there will be an activation of B cells, the antibodies are going to be produced and then they will actually going to coat the bacteria with this particular antibody and that actually will going to allow the antigen presenting cells to recognize these uh, bacteria more efficiently with the help of the cell surface receptor because now they, they are not dependent on the antigen which is being expressed on the bacteria because the amount of antigen which is being expressed on the bacteria is very small or very little compared to the antibodies which are going to be uh, bind to this particular bacteria and the receptor for that particular uh, receptor for the antibody is going to be uh, is going to be more efficiently bind the antigen presenting cell and that is how the whole this cascade is going to be amplified. In the meantime, the, the B cells are going to be differentiate into the plasma cells and then the plasma cells are going to be start producing the antibodies. These antibodies are again going to participate into the immune responses. So, this is what is going to be shown into this figure where the antigen is going to be processed by the antigen presenting cells such as macrophages and then it is going to be expressed along with the MSC class 2 and then that actually is going to activate the T helper cells and T helper cells again uh, going to activate the B cells and that stage the B cell is going to be differentiate into two cells one is called as the plasma cells the other one is called as the memory cells and then the plasma cells will start producing the antibodies and these antibodies are actually going to contribute further into the more robust immune response because these antibodies are soluble in nature. So, they will actually going to activate the uh, more cells and more Im robust immune response because uh, the purpose of the antibody is to uh, sequester the antigen as well as to amplify the initial signal so that you are actually going to uh, activate the complete immune responses. Now let us understand what is uh, meant by the polyclonal as well as the monoclonal antibody. So antibodies what is being produced by an organism could be into the two categories, one is called polyclonal, the other one is called as the monoclonal antibodies. So now what you can imagine, what you can see is that you have an antigen, you can imagine that this is a very big protein which actually contains the multiple types of antigenic sites and all these antigenic sites are called as 
the epitopes which means a, a antigen could have the multiple epitopes like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 and all these and epitopes when they are going to be processed by the antigen presenting cells are going to be expressed along with the MSC class 2 and subsequently they are actually going to activate the B cells and then the B cells are going to activate the plasma cells. So, in this process what will happen is that they are actually going to activate the multiple plasma cells. So, you are going to have for example, if you are processing the uh, epitope A1, it is actually going to activate one type of plasma cells and that actually is going to start producing the antibodies. Similarly, you have the epitope 2, 3, 4 and 5. All these epitopes are actually producing the different types of antibodies which is antibodies which are directed against 1, the antibodies which are directed against 2 and so on. So, what will happen is that if you collect all these antibodies which are coming from the different cells, for example, this is number 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4 and this is 5. So, if you are collecting the antibodies which are coming from the 5 or more different types of cells like different types of plasma cells which are actually be the clones then the antibody is called as the polyclonal antibody which means the poly means many clonal means the clones which means if the antibodies are coming from the multiple clones of the multiple antigens uh, multiple antigens or the antigens but uh, a multiple epitopes of a single antigen then the resultant antibody is called as the polyclonal antibody whereas if you see the epitope number 6 it is actually going to be processed by the single plasma cell and that actually is going to give you the antibodies and these antibodies are going to called as the monoclonal antibodies. Mi mono means single, clonal means the clone. So, if a single epitope is being processed by the single clone and you are collecting the antibodies from a single clone then it is called as the monoclonal antibodies which means the monoclonal polyclonal antibody means the antibodies from the many clones and polyclonal antibodies are going to be produced inside the animals under the natural conditions. So, under the natural conditions when a bacteria is going to be processed in an organism, it does not produce the monoclonal antibody, it produces the antibodies against the multiple epitopes of a single antigen which means uh, it could be a uh, multiple proteins and uh, a combination of multiple proteins or it could be a uh, multiple epitopes or multiple antigenic regions present on the single antigens. Irrespective of the conditions, the purpose of producing a polyclonal antibody is that you want to increase the multiple antibodies possible for a single antigen so that you will be able to recognize these uh, antigens and you will be able to uh, create a robust immune response. Compared to that the monoclonal antibody means the antibodies from a single clone and single because you cannot do that naturally because you cannot have any way to ask the body to only select a single clone and start producing the antibodies. It is actually being done by a in, in vitro technique which is called as the hybridoma technologies. So, these are the two ways in which you can be able to produce the antibodies. One the polyclonal antibody where you can directly use the animals or the monoclonal antibodies where you have to use a hybridoma technology to select the clone and then ask the clone to produce the antibodies. So, this is what we are going to discuss in this particular lecture. So, generation of a polyclonal antibodies. In a generation of a polyclonal antibody, we have discussed when we were discussing about the affinity chromatography. So, we are not going to discuss that in detail, but except that just for your, just for your refreshing your memory, 
what we have discussed is that you can have the two different types of antigen either the hapten so hapten is also going to be present or going to be converted into the antigen with the help of a uh, carrier protein such as the klh or some other uh, carrier protein so that the haptens are going to be con converted into the antigen haptens are the antigens which are non immunogenic so you can have the antigens which are immunogenic which means they can be able to create a robust immune response or you can have you can have the antigen which are non immunogenic so these haptens are the non immunogenic uh, antigens so you have to convert them into a immunogenic antigens and that you have to do simply by adding a carrier protein so that their size actually will go up because the haptens are non immunogenic because they are of small size so you have to add tag them to a carrier protein such as the klh or bsa or any other uh, immunogenic carrier protein so that they will going to cause the immune response then these are the professional antigens which are immunogen also then you have to process them for making a preparation which means the antigen are going to mix with the uh, you have to make the antigen ready for the immunization then you have to immunize the animals by this antigen preparation then once you immunize the animals you have to test the animal for generation of the antibodies once you confirm that the antibodies are been produced then you can be able to bleed the animals and then ultimately you can collect the serum and from this serum you can be able to do the purification of the antibodies and that actually is going to give you the polyclonal antibodies and as i explained in the previous slide itself why it is polyclonal because the antigen is going to be made up of of multiple epitopes and that's how the multiple epitopes are going to be uh, activates the multiple b cells and ultimately the multiple b cells are going to be converted into the multiple uh, plasma cells and that's how you are going to get the antibodies of from the multiple uh, clones and that's how you, it is going to be a polyclonal antibodies for a monoclonal antibodies the process is little more complicated because in this you have first you are going to uh, immunize the animals and then you are going to produce the multiple clones and then these multiple clones have to be uh, you know screened and then you have to select the single clone in a, a monoclonal antibodies what you have to do first is you have to first take the antigens then means you have to produce the antigen in large quantities then you have to do a emulsification of this antigen so that you will be able to uh, uh, make it ready for immunization then you have to do the immunization of these animals then you have to test the antibodies whether the antibodies are being produced or not and then you are going to do the bleeding then you collect the serum and then you test the antibodies so once you test that there are sufficient quantity of antibodies are being present in this particular animal then you take this animal and the prepare the b cell from the spleen and then you also culture the myeloma cells and then you fuse the myeloma and the b cells to form the hybridomas then you screen the fused cells and then ultimately you are going to harvest the monoclonal antibodies from the single clone let's see how to do the these procedures so in a typical monoclonal antibody production as we discussed first you take the antigen you immunize the animals you collect the spleen then on a side you collect, you culture the myeloma cell lines you uh, take the myeloma cells mix them together with the fusing reactions that will contain the pyrethrin glycol that actually is going to give you the hybridomas these hybridomas can be grown in mass culture so that you can be able to produce the antibodies or if you can freeze these hybridomas so that whenever is required you can just take out this hybridoma inject it into the animal so that it will actually going to uh, you know recover from the uh, from the freezing and then you can be able to produce the antibodies so these are the multiple steps what you require to ch uh, challenge the animals so purification of the antigens the antigen used to immunize to be as pure as possible use of pure antigen reduces the generation of cross reactive antibodies 
we have already discussed about how to prepare the antigen you can prepare the antigen under the native condition simply by doing uh, chromatography techniques or you can prepare the antigen under denatural condition with the help of the electro illusions once your antigen is ready then you have to prepare the immunogen so what you do is you combine the 100 microliter of antigen with a uh, equal amount of fluids complete adjuvant to a final volume of 200 microliter then you mix thoroughly to obtain the emulsion using a syringe or a pipette you have to check the uh, the emulsion whether it is a good emulsion or not simply by dropping a small drop of uh, emulsion into a uh, water and what is the good thing is a good emulsion will not spread onto the water surface which means the emulsion is going to remain intact when even if you drop it onto the water then before you immunization you take out the blood and so that it is actually going to tell you whether the what is the titer of the antibodies present in the animal before you did the immunizations incubate the sample at 4 degree and then you collect the serum and you can keep this uh, serum uh, and label it as a pre immune serum which means you can collect the serum and store it at minus 20 degree and that is considered going to be a pre immune serum which is actually going to be a control serum so that it will tell you what is the amount of antibodies present in this animal before doing the immunizations then you are going to do the immunizations you take out the animals or the mice in this case with the help and that a strain what you are going to use is the balsi strain you first uh, sterilize them with the help of the 70 percent alcohol then you are going to inject the antigen mixture what we have prepared and during this step either use as a helper so that he will hold the mice or you can use a strain device to hold the mice uh, briefly clean the injection site with the 70 percent ethanol and inject antigen through multiple routes so you have a multiple routes through which you can be able to inject the antigens either you can inject as an intravenous so the intention mixture can be directly injected into the tail vein of the mice so that is actually going to create very uh, small uh, immune response because if you inject directly into the intravenous injections it is actually going to cause the, uh, the anaphylactic shocks first of all and the second is it may sometime actually clear the infection clear the uh, antigen very fast so that it will not going to create very robust immune response so you can only inject uh, antigen in an intravenous mode if you know that the antigen is very very immunogenic then you can inject in an intraperitoneal injections while making ip injections avoid injecting the antigen into the stomach because uh, you want to do a intra peritone intra uh, peritoneal injections but don't inject it into the uh, stomach because otherwise it is go actually going to create lot of trouble to the mice then you can also do a subcutaneous or the intra muscular injections and that you can do into the thigh muscles and these these kind of injections are actually creates a robust immune response because the uh, delivery of the antigen remains very for a very very long time because when you inject it into the muscles or into the subcutaneously that area is inaccessible for the immune system for uh, and it is not inaccessible for the blood supply also so that's why the uh, the antigen will remain with the body for a very very long time and that actually is going to create a robust immune response uh, after injection keep the mice back into the case then you are uh, going to do another injections after some time the only difference is that you are going to use the fluents incomplete adjuvants so in the primary injections you are going to use the fluents complete adjuvants in the secondary injections you are going to use the fluents incomplete adjuvants to a final volume of 200 microliters mix thoroughly to obtain a emulsion and this is all is uh, going to be remain same so when you do the uh, secondary injections with the fluids incomplete adjuvants it is actually going to create the memory b cells then you are going to do a uh, antibody titer so before you proceed further for you know 
taking out the spleen and generating the uh, hybridomas, you have to ensure that the antibody is being produced. So, what you are going to do is you take out the blood from the uh, mice and you know prepare the serum from the mice and then uh, you are going to generate determine the antibody level with the help of the ELISA and uh, you are going to use the indirect ELISA which are which we are going to discuss uh, in a subsequent lectures. So, up to this uh, we have immunized the animals and we got the antibody producing the animals. So, in subsequent to that now since we have the immunized animals we can further proceed to generate the hybridomas and to screen the hybridomas and then to select the monoclonal antibodies. So, for that first you have to do is first you have to isolate the B cells from the spleen, you have to culture the myeloma cells, you have to put them uh, into the fusion reaction so that the myeloma and the B cell are going to be fused. Once you got the hybridomas then you have to screen the hybridomas so that you will know which clone is producing good antibodies and then you can be able to do the harvesting. So, technically you have the more and more like 4 major steps which you have to follow to generate the hybridomas and then to screen them to produce the to recover the antibodies from these hybridomas. Before going into the hybridoma preparation you have to prepare the peritoneal executed cells. These peritoneal executed cells are actually the feeder cells which are required for culturing the hybridoma cells and preparation of the uh, peritoneal skewed cell has multiple steps. So, first thing what you have to do is you have to sacrifice the non immunized mice either by the cervical dislocation or the CO2 esterization. Cervical dislocation is like a process which actually going to break the linkage between the uh, ribs or between the uh, vertebra and that is how actually it does not allow a uh, animal to breathe properly and that is how animal is going to die. But cervical dislocation is not very popular method, mostly people use the CO2 expiations where you are actually simply keeping the animal in a CO2 chamber, you incubate it for some time and then because there is no oxygen present the animal is going to die. Then other option is that you can actually inject the uh, some of the uh, anesthesia uh, uh, reagents like uh, ketazine or xylazine and th that actually also is very much acceptable where you can just anesthetize the animals and you can actually be able to go through with this process because the ultimate aim of doing any animal procedure is that you should give them the minimum pain and that is why the people prefer to kill them rather than uh, keeping them under the anesthesia so that they will going to feel the pain while you are dissecting them and taking out the different types of organs and cells. Then you spray the so, uh, animals with the 95 ascohol so that it will start the dissection of so that it is going to be sterile because all this procedure has to be done in a in a biosafety cabinet or the laminar hood. Then you going to open the abdominal region and expose the peritoneal cavity inject 3 to 5 ml of serum free media into the peritoneal cavity using a disposable syringe, flush the peritoneum and collect the peritoneum executed cells and plate it onto a disposable petri dish with 10 ml serum free DMM media. Then you count the cells and dilute the cells to the 4 into 10 to the power 5 cells, allow the cell to incubate for 2 days and possible contamination need to be checked before using these cells for hybridoma culture which means the peritoneum executed cells are going to be recovered from the peritoneum of the animals. So, this is the peritoneum of a particular uh, organisms. So, you, what you have to do is you just inject the needle uh, and you you know you inject the, uh, the some amount of the uh, non serum containing uh, media into the belly and then you are going to recover the same cells and when you recover it actually going to give you the peritoneum executed cells and these peritoneum executed cells you can keep it onto a patty dish, culture them for 2 days so that it is actually going to tell you whether the preparation is free of bacteria and other kind of uh, contaminations or not because if there will be a contamination it is actually going to contaminate your hybridoma culture as well. 
then you are going to prepare the spleen cells. So exactly the same way you sacrifice the mice uh, as we discussed before that either by cervical dislocation or the CO2 excitation. Then you sterilize the animal with the help of 95% alcohol. Then you, uh, then you make a small cut at the abdominal region and dissect to remove the spleen using a forceps and plate it into a disposable patty dish. Then you inject 2 to 5 ml serum free media into the spleen and this step will swell the tissue. For example, if you inject it into the spleen, it is going to swell. Then you are going to break the uh, spleen into uh, with the help of the forceps and release the cells into the patty dishes. Then you remove the debris and cell clump. You centrifuge this at uh, 50 G for room temperature and then incubate the cells in a graze hemolytic solutions. So the Gray's hemolytic solution is a combination of 8 ml of Gray's solution A and 2 ml of grain solution B. This solution is actually containing some of the compounds which are actually going to take up by the RBCs and in that process the RBCs are actually going to break open which means in, by, by the help of the grey solutions you are actually going to eliminate the RBC. So it actually induces the hemolysis into the system without affecting the spleen cells. So this step is going to remove the RBC from the cells leaving the myeloma cells. Then you collect the cells and plate it into a tea flask and grow it up to the mid log phase. The resuspended the cells in the serum free DMM media at room temperature. In the next step you have a myeloma cells, you have the myeloma cells, you have the spleen cells and now you are going to generate the fusion reactions. Mix the spleen as well as the myeloma cells in a ratio of 5 to 1 or 10 to 1 in a sterile centrifuge tube. Centrifuge the cells at 120 G for 5 minutes at room temperature and remove the supernatant. Now gently tap the bottom of the tube and add 1 ml of 50% polyethylene glycol or PEG 6000 in a serum free media. The PEG solution should be added drop wise to avoid the clumping of the cells. So polyethylene glycol is a fusion reaction. Polyethylene glycol is actually bringing the cell membranes closer to each other and in that process the lipid bilayer is going to be dissolved and that is how the cells are getting fused with each other. You can imagine that you have one cell like this, you have another cell like this and when you add the PEG. The, what the PEG is doing is it is actually bringing these two cells together. Okay? So at this point you have uh, these two cells fused to each other or they are going to be placed to each other and now the, uh, the lipids what is present here or lipid is present here is going to make, uh, dissolve with each other and ultimately what you are going to get you are going to get a syncytia. Okay. So if you do not do this process in a controlled fashion, you are instead of getting a fusion of two cells, it is actually you are going to get a fusion of multiple cells and that is how you are actually going to get a clump rather than the fused cells. Then you centrifuge, uh, so dilute the mixture by adding 3 ml of worms or over a period of 1 to 2 minutes. Then you centrifuge the fused cells and resuspend the cell in a DMEM containing 20% fetal, fetal bovine serum at a cell density of 10 to power 5 or 10 to power 6 cells per ml. Then you add the 50 microliter feeders PEC cells in 96 cell plate and on the top of this add the 50 microliter of fused cells which means you have to keep the feeder cells in the bottom and then on the top you are going to keep the hybrid cells or the fused cells. Incubate the cells at 37 degrees Celsius with 5% CO2 prior to go to the next step of screening these hybridomas. So then you once this is this system is ready, then you take it to the CO2 incubator and incubate for uh, the 24 hours. Then you have to do a selection of hybridoma cells. So what we have done, we have just taken out the B cells, we have taken out the myeloma cells, then we fuse them with the help of the PEG. So now you have the hybrid cells uh, and these hybrid cells are going to be screened with the help of 
the hat medium and what hat medium is going to do is it is not going to allow the, the growth of the B cells because the B cells are the primary cells so they will going to die after some time. The myeloma cells are also not going to survive because the hat media has some of the uh, inhibitors which are actually going to kill the uh, some of the crucial pathways present in the, the myeloma cells. What the cells is going to grow is the hybrid cells because you have the growth potential from this cells and you have the indefinite growth potential or indefinite growth phenotype from this cells. So, the only cell is going to grow is the hybrid cells. So, hybridoma cells contain the spleen cells capable of coding the antibody whereas the myeloma cells does not produce antibodies but has the ability to grow indefinitely. Incubating hybridoma cells in hat media allows the growth of the fused cells whereas the unfused individual myeloma cells or the kidney cells does not be able to grow. Why they are not been able to grow? Because the hat has a, uh, has a as an inhibitor so that actually is going to interfere with the nucleic acid synthesis. So, nucleic acid synthesis is essential for the growth and multiplication of any cell. So, HAT medium actually inhibits the de novo pathway and the cells with salvage pathway only can survive which means the de novo what is mean by de novo pathway? De novo pathway means the pathway the so you have the two pathway of nucleic acid synthesis de novo pathway as well as the salvage pathway. The de novo pathway is the pathway which actually utilizes the raw material for example, the carbon dioxide, ammonia, water and all those kind of raw material to synthesize the nucleotides either the purine nucleotides or the pyrimidine nucleotides and then you can be able to utilize these purine or pyrimidine nucleotides for DNA synthesis. Whereas, in the salvage pathway you are not synthesizing the nucleotide from the raw materials. You are actually utilizing the uh, degraded nucleotides or sometime you are also utilizing the amino acids or sometime you are utilizing the, uh, the incompletely formed nucleotides as a source to synthesize the purine or the pyrimidines. And that is why the salvage pathway requires the lesser resources or the it is actually a quick way of synthesizing the nucleotides compared to the de novo pathway where you are going to start with the raw material. So, actually the hat media is containing the inhibitor which actually going to kill the de novo pathway. So, what will happen? The de novo pathway is uh, so myeloma cells depend solely on the de novo pathway which means for nucleotide acid synthesis whereas the kidney cells has both de novo as well as the salvage pathway which means the, the myelomide cells are actually cannot be run the salvage pathway or it they are not going to run their metabolism until they are actually going to have the supply of nucleotide from the other sources. Because the de novo pathway is already been blocked they cannot go with the salvage pathway because that is already already not present in these cells. So, they are completely dependent on the de novo pathway and since you incubating the uh, the these cells in the hat media which actually contains the amenopterin. Amenopterin is a is a inhibitor which actually blocks the de novo pathway, but it does not affect the salvage pathway which starts from the hypoxanthin. So, uh, the, the myeloid cells are not going to survive because there is a uh, blockage of de novo pathway whereas, the B cells are can be able to synthesize because their de novo pathway is going to be blocked, but they have still have the salvage pathway. But the B cells are the primary cells, they cannot go for multiple rounds of multiplication because they do not have the, they are not transformed cells. So, they have a limited uh, life age or limited number of multiplication through which they can undergo. So, because of that they cannot also survive for a very, very long time. So, if you grow them for a 4 or 5 rounds the B cells are also going to die. The only cell which is going to survive is the cell which has the salvage pathway 
and the cell which has been transformed by the uh, which has a transformation uh, phenotype which means it actually can go for an indefinite period and the only cells which has this uh, uh, property is the hybrid cells. Uh, so, in the presence of HAD, the individual myeloid cells or the kidney cells will not survive whereas the only hybrid cell can be able to survive. Now, once you are done the selection of the hybridoma cells, you have to further screen the hybridomas for looking for the antibodies uh, or the you know the which, which hybridoma is screening the more, more antibodies and less antibodies. For that you are going to do a serial dilutions or serial dilution method. So, once the colonies are observed, you isolate these cells by serial dilution methods, delineate the boundary of each colony with a marker from the back side of the plate, then you remove the media and put the colony rings. For example, uh, you first got these number of hybridomas, what you can do is you just put the colony uh, you know chambers and then you are going to add the trypsinize them with the help of the trypsin EDTA to remove the colony and then you wash the colony with PBS and transfer it into the one well of 24 well dish, allow it to grow and become 80 percent confluent. The transfer these cells to 6 well dish and subsequently you can bring it to the 10 centimeter dish and that is how you are actually and then ultimately take a small aliquot of the cells and test the presence of the antibody with the help of ELISA. Harvesting of monoclonal antibodies, once the color of the media got changes from red to yellow or orange, change the media with the, with the fresh DMM containing uh, 20 percent uh, fetal calf serum, 1x hat and 20 percent uh, feeder cells. The healthy cell line that produces antibodies is transferred to the 24 well dish containing 30 to 60 ml of complete media for the large production of antibody. Harvest the supernatant by transferring culture into a tube and centrifuge it at 120 G for 10 minutes. Transfer the supernatant to a fresh tube and adjust the pH to 7.2. You can add the sodium azide as well as and you can keep or preserve this supernatant at minus 20 for very, very long time. This we have already discussed, uh, once you got the antibodies, you can be able to purify uh, the antibodies simply by running the affinity chromatography, where you have the multiple steps. First, you are going to prepare a multiple affinity column with the help of the antigen coupled to the column. So, the, here you can use the, for example, the CNBR mediated uh, coupling to couple the antigen to the uh, sephiros beads and that is how you are going to prepare the affinity column and then you are going to do equilibration of the column with the high salt. For example, you can use the 0.5 molar NaCl so that you will going to destroy the non-specific interactions. Then you are going to prepare the sample, then you are going to wash the column two times with 10 column volume using the equilibration buffers and that actually is going to remove the non-specifically bound proteins and then ultimately you are going to do the elutions. So, elution in this case can be done either by following the counter ions or you can be able to use the, uh, the cryotropic salts or you can actually play with the uh, different types of pH, so you can reduce the pH. And once you are done with the elution, then you can just simply wash the column with the high salt concentrations, cryotropic salts and other kinds of material and then your column is ready to run for the second round. But if you are not interested to run at that moment, then you have to preserve this column in 20 percent alcohol containing 0.05 percent sodium azide. So, with this uh, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Uh, in our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the interaction of the antigen and antibodies and how you can be able to use that property of the antibody to recognize the antigen as a tool to perform different types of experiments. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you.